So let this word from Isaiah 40 summon you and your heart to the appropriate worship of God. Isaiah 40, verse 9. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Our Father in God, you have given us a great shepherd. And so we praise you in the name of the Lord Jesus for the Lord Jesus. We thank you that in Christ we can say with all of our hearts and with loud and thankful voices, Behold your God. And so, God, we pray now that our eyes would be open to behold you in your word, behold you in song, behold you in prayer, behold you in our fellowship, so that our gaze would be filled with the image of the glory of God, and that this would ring out through all of creation and fill the earth this we pray in Jesus' name, and amen. We worship. Well, as we go to prayer, I just want to make you aware of a couple of things that we're going to pray about. Uh, first of all, we'll pray for, uh, uh, I want to focus on a couple of missionaries that we support today in, in our prayer time. And uh, then we're going to uh, do another baby blessing, Katie and Joe and Iris and uh, Aramis and Oren. But uh, I want to pray first for our missionaries. And uh, so... Bud and Lois Fuchs, we'll pray for them, and they minister in Utah, and uh, they're planting a church specifically to reach internationals, and so they're going to have multi-ethnic, multilingual uh, church plant, so they need our prayers. I'm also going to pray for Scott and Brenda Zior, and their ministry is to India, and uh, I don't know if any of you get their updates or not, but there was a picture in Scott and Brenda's most recent update, and there's a picture of one of the... A ch one of the first church services held at this new church in India where the pastor was mentored by, uh, by Scott. And so it was really exciting to see. And something caught my attention in the picture. And the picture is of a room uh, relatively full of people. And on the floor are all these, these rugs. And on, on the top of the rugs are the people sitting on the floor in worship. Now, and I don't know about you, but when I've had seasons in my life where I've looked for a church, right, and tried to decide on hmm, this church or that church, usually chairs were kind of a given. You know, like usually chairs, you know, I didn't, it wasn't on my list, but I think if I'd shown up and there were no chairs, I might, you know, check around and see if there was another option, right? I, th this, is not, this is not the situation. That, that, that they're in, in India. They're just happy to find other people that believe in Jesus, too. And, and they probably don't give a second thought about the fact that there are no chairs. And it made me think, man, I don't even know, I don't even realize how spoiled I am, right? We don't even realize, like, the blessings we have. We don't even think about the things that bother us uh, about our church experience as something that would never even move the needle in, in the heart of a believer in a place like India or, or China or Africa or Ukraine or any of the other places in the world that the body of Christ has spread to. And so we want to praise God for the believers worshiping in India and for Scott, who has ministered to the pastor that is planting this church. And so, and then we want to lift up pathways and, uh, and then we want to bless baby Iris Jones. So, would you pray with me? Father and God, I pray for Bud and Lois this morning, and we thank you for their ministry uh, in Utah to international students. We pray that their work would be fruitful. Uh, we, you deserve to be worshipped by all of them. You deserve the love and the adoration and the affection and the worship and the obedience of the nations. And so, we pray for um, Bud and Lois as they seek to fulfill your commission and, and to reach internationals right here uh, in the United States. And we pray for Scott and Brenda, and we thank you for the 
um, for the work that Scott has done in this pastor's life, that this pastor feels ready to, to take a step of faith and to plant this church and to start worshiping with these believers and, and being responsible for their spiritual care. And we pray, God, that you would protect them, that you'd watch over them, that you would bless them, that they would grow spiritually, that they'd grow numerically, that your name would be honored, that your name would be believed on, that people would experience a rescue and freedom from the worship of their idols, that you would protect the health of their church, that you protect the unity of their church, that they would love one another, and that their unity with one another would be explained by nothing else than the word of God and the glory of God. Of Jesus Christ. Let me pray that you would continue to grant us a ministry to them, grant us a, a healthy body of believers to support the spread of your gospel to the ends of the earth. God, we pray for our friends at Pathways also, who minister right here in our city limits, and we thank you for their ministry. We thank you for the service they provide. We thank you for our relationship with them, and we just pray for again, for your provision so that we can continue to show the love of Jesus to those um, that need that ministry. God, we pray now for your kindness and grace to be thick, to be heavy, to be full in our hearts um, as we continue to worship together. And we pray this in Jesus' name and amen. Okay, all right. Well, Katie, if you want to come over here and Joe. Um, and uh, Oren and Aramis, you guys are welcome to come over and hang out with us too. Uh, we want to pray for you guys and celebrate the birth of baby Iris. Now, while they're coming, a little story that uh, is, is fun and a blessing. A couple of weeks ago, um, well, let me back up. You guys have been teaching the, the boys. Um, he's got the whole world in his hands. Yep. And, and one of the things you guys have taught them to do is not just saying he's got the whole world in his hands, but to actually name some specific things that God has in his hands. So, you know, God's got the whole world in his hands, but God also has mommy and daddy in his hands and grandpa and grandma in his hands. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we were informed that Aramis here broke out in a rendition of, and God's got Pastor Corey in his hands, and God's got Pastor Brandon in his hands. And the whole church, he's got the whole church in his hands, right? And so that is, that is the fruit of your parenting. And we're so blessed. Um, breath, okay. We're so blessed to see the fruit of your parenting have that effect in, in your kids' lives. And um, we just think you guys are doing an awesome job. So, um, so we praise God for that and uh, excited to have the Joneses as part of our church family and to welcome little Iris into the congregation is a blessing. We got her eyes shining and checking all you out, which is good, keeping an eye on you guys. So, um, so yeah, we want to pray for you guys and bless you with uh, one resource for family devotions that you guys can take home with you. And so I would invite you as a congregation, would you just to show your loving support, would you stand and pray for the Joneses with us? Well, our Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing of our children, and they are a blessing. Uh, we just agree with you in this, that uh, nowhere in your word do you ever talk about our children as a burden. And we know that this is your heart towards us. Though we can be ornery, though we can be uh, wayward, uh, you, do ne you never talk about us as a burden. You love us. You, um, you have sent your son for us. And so we agree with you that uh, that our children are a blessing. And you've made Iris here in your image, and this means she is fearfully and wonderfully made. And so we praise you for this wonder. We thank you for the life of Iris, and just acknowledge along with you and your word that you have made her for your glory, and so we give you this glory as our creator. And you've made Iris to know you and experience the love and grace of the Lord Jesus because Jesus was born and because he took on flesh and because he bore our punishment on the cross, all of us can have life and joy and peace and forgiveness of sin and actually be born again into your family. And this is our prayer for Iris, Lord. We pray that Iris would be born again, that she would know the grace of the Lord Jesus for as long as she can remember. We pray that there wouldn't be a time in which Iris doesn't know the good news of Jesus and know that Jesus loves her 
and, sent and, and gave himself on the cross for her. And so we pray for Joe and Katie, that you give them all the spiritual gifts required to raise Iris to fear you, to love you, and to trust you, and to follow you with her whole heart. And I pray for Oren and Aramis as well, that you would give them a love for Jesus that just makes them excellent big brothers. And give this whole family hearts to know you as the supreme treasure of their lives so that when they speak and when they serve, that when they rise and when they lie down and in whatever they do, enable them to do it all for the glory of our great God and Savior. And we pray this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen, amen. All right, guys, so this is for you. This will take you through every major teaching in the Bible. And so you, you think you can make your mom and dad read this to you? You want to hold that for me? That's yours to have now, okay? Okay, all right. God bless you guys. So we're going to sing now. <laughs> but as we sing, we're going to give as well. So uh, as, uh, as, uh, as we sing, the ushers are going to come. The ushers are going to pass the offering. We invite you to give uh, as the Holy Spirit leads you. Let's uh, worship. All right, kids. Kids, make them up for the children's sermon. Well, hey there, my little Christian siblings. Uh, today, Pastor Corey is preaching on James chapter 2. And one of the things he will talk about is partiality, which is sort of a big word. Uh, does anybody have any idea what partiality is? Anybody? Raise your hand if you have the slightest idea. Grayson? Okay, that's a good idea. Anybody else have an idea? I would not expect that this is a word any of you know yet. In fact, I would bet there's some adults that don't know what it means, too. <laughs> yes, Zach? Something that's partial. Okay, sure. All right, so here it is. Listen, if you want to know, this is what it is. Okay, partiality has to do with how you treat different people differently. Now, it's not always bad to treat different people differently. For instance, um, I wrestle my seven-year-old son, but I do not wrestle my 72 year old father okay I treat them different because they are different um, but here's the thing the difference here is that the reason I treat them differently is because I love them right if I wrestle my seven-year-old right here that's Sammy if I wrestle with him it's a joy and it's very very fun if I wrestle my 72 year old dad he becomes injured and goes to the hospital okay so in that particular instance, it's very good to treat people different. It's, in fact, loving to treat them different. So sometimes we do need to treat people differently, but those differences need to be motivated by love. Now, sometimes, however, we treat people differently because we want something from them or because we naturally like or naturally dislike certain kinds of people. So for instance, uh, say I have two friends and, and one is rich can you guess which one's the rich one? Yeah, and one's poor. Okay, and I thought that, you know what, if I'm nicer to my rich friend, maybe he'll give me something. And so uh, I always let the rich friend choose the games we play, or if my rich and poor friend are ever having a conflict or an argument, I always side with my rich friend. Or maybe I even tell my poor friend to be quiet and not make such a fuss um, to try to be on the side of my rich friend. If I do this, I'm partial. I'm treating one of them differently, but not because I love them. I'm treating them differently because I love myself. Now, there's a lot of other reasons we might show partiality. We might be partial to quiet people who don't disturb us, or people who have certain skills, or people who are popular, or people who are really, really funny, or people who have a measure of earthly power, or people who look a certain way. In fact, uh, racism is actually a form of partiality in many cases. Uh, we can show partiality for a lot of different reasons, but here's why this is silly. Partiality is silly because God designed us all 
every one of us, including our differences. And what makes us valuable is not those tiny little differences, but that we're all created in the image of the same God. What makes us valuable is that we are created in God's image. And we'll come back and talk about that more next week, because next week we're going to keep talking about, about partiality. Okay, but let's pray. Uh, Father God, I thank you so much for these children. Um, they're just a, a blessing to our church. Uh, Father, I thank you for the new babies as well. Uh, over and over and over in the Bible, uh, filling the quiver, as it is called, is, is a source of blessing. And that's not just something you do in certain families. It's also something you're doing in this church. So, Father, we know for certain that because you keep filling this church with babies and with children, that your blessing is upon us. Uh, and so, Father, as always, I, I pray, Lord, that you would help these kids to grow, that they would be different kinds of kids in this world, uh, that their faith would be rooted uh, deeply in you, uh, that they would love the church and know how to live within it, uh, although it is imperfect, uh, that they would be servant-hearted and generous. And I pray, Lord, that you would help them to be brave and courageous and, because people show partiality because of fear as well. So, Father, help them to love like you love, to treat people as uh, Jesus calls us to, and as always, help us adults in this room to be good examples uh, for what that means to them. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Um, turn to the book of James, chapter 2. James, chapter 2. I just want to read the first 13 verses, and then we'll pray. So James chapter 2, starting in verse 1, <clears throat> this is the word of God. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you've dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy is triumphs over judgment. Let's pray. Our Father and God, this is your word, and so we pray that we would treat it so, that we would want it to sink deeply into our hearts, that even though, um, I pray, that even though we may not feel like this passage confronts any one of the particular temptations or weaknesses that we might have, I pray that you would test that out in us, that there is, if any, partiality in us, that you'd root it out, that this would be something that you use to even put it to death in us. So we pray for your blessing. We pray for your help. We pray for you to open our eyes and soften our hearts and keep my mouth faithful. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the main point of this passage is to hold the faith without favoritism. To hold the faith without favoritism. As you can see, 
Uh, the verse probably with the most force in this passage is the command in verse 1 to not show partiality or favoritism. It's one of only three commands in the, uh, all 13 verses. And even the other two commands in the passage all point back at this one. Now, we all know what favoritism is. Uh, Brandon just explained it beautifully. It's when we respect or honor people based on outward, superficial, even unimportant kinds of factors. And then we tend to disregard or dishonor those who do not possess those qualities. Or... Even worse, we might even respect or honor someone because we think we might be able to gain something from them, and then we might dishonor or disrespect other people because we can't gain anything from them. James illustrates this for us in verses 2 through 4, supposing the scenario of a rich man coming to attend a worship service, and he's honored while the poor man is dishonored simply because he is poor and not because he is rich. Maybe you don't feel this temptation at all. Maybe you do. Either way, understand that this was a significant temptation for the people that James was writing to. You can see, for example, in verses 6 and 7 that apparently the, the people in these churches were actually being oppressed and dragged into court by these wealthy unbelievers. Uh, In chapter 5, even, in chapter 5, verse 4, James actually talks to those wealthy unbelievers directly. And he says that the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of of the Lord of hosts. So apparently the people in the churches that James is writing to were mostly, or many of them, humble, believing farmhands who had been robbed of their wages and who had cried out to the Lord for deliverance and the Lord had heard their prayers from heaven and was storing up judgment against these wealthy unbelievers. But that judgment had not been poured out yet. The believers were left to wait and to wonder what God was up to. And in the waiting, if one of these wealthy unbelievers had showed up to church, apparently the temptation for these Christians would have basically been to suck up to them. In other words, they might have been tempted to think, well, if we can't beat them, maybe we can favor them and find some relief from our troubles. Perhaps even James heard of some isolated incidents where these people were favored and were honored, and as a result, the poor and maybe even poor believers were ignored and disregarded. How would you speak to your church if that were the situation? If you were James, how would you speak? to your church if they were doing this. I know I would strongly be tempted to preach a knock-it-off sermon. Right? Stop it. Stop being such horrible people. Point A, you're horrible people. Sub-point, you're really horrible. Right? Knock it off. That would be the kind of sermon I might be tempted to preach. And maybe that's how this text sounds to you as you read it. But I think James is actually far more encouraging and pastoral than that. Notice, for example, that verse 1, it doesn't just say, don't show, har- don't show partiality. He doesn't just say, don't do this. It actually says, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's actually a very positive command. It's even more positive in the original language, which reads more like this. Brothers, it is not with favoritism that you should hold the faith. The emphasis is on holding the faith, keeping the faith in our Lord Jesus, focusing on Jesus so that we don't go astray in how we treat people. The point is to hold the faith, but not with favoritism. And from this main point flow three reasons why we should do this, why this is so important. So that's the outline. Hold the faith without favoritism, 
for three reasons. So, number one, the first reason we must hold the faith without favoritism is that favoritism comes from evil thoughts. Favoritism comes from evil thoughts. Notice verse 4 when he says that if this is what you're doing, then have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? This is a great example of James's plain, direct pastoral language. He is such a good pastor. I feel so well pastored by James when I read verses like this because he doesn't care what I think about that sentence. He, he doesn't care if I have any advice about how to soften it up and make it more palatable. It's just a plain and loving and forceful. He says evil thoughts is where your favoritism comes from. And when you show favoritism, you have become a judge with evil thoughts. Now, there's nothing wrong with exercising judgment. In the, in the Christian faith, we are actually told to judge. We are told to take specks out of one another's eyes. That's the most frequently ignored portion of Matthew 7. And really, if we're being honest, we all recognize this is what it's saying. This is sensible. We even have a phrase for it. We tell our children to what? Exercise good judgment, right? And if we don't like the word judgment, maybe we'll tell them to practice discernment. So we know there's a place for this. There's a, just as Brandon said, there's a place for distinguishing and noticing differences and treating things differently, for practicing that kind of discernment. But obviously this isn't what's going on in James. What's going on in James is that everyone is practicing the sort of judgment you have when there's a log in your eye. What's going on is judgment with evil thoughts. I think we see the root of this problem explained in verse 4 when he talks about making distinctions. Making distinctions is the root of the problem. And this phrase, making distinctions, is an interesting one. It tells us a lot about the problem. Uh, the phrase is actually only one word in the, in the Greek language. And it not only can refer to making distinctions or making judgments, but it can also refer to doubt or hesitation or uncertainty. It, it can refer, in other words, to the idea where you're examining something so closely and you're distinguishing all the different parts and you're, and you're nitpicking it apart so much that the, that the best thing that you could say about what you're really doing is doubting being tossed about and indecisive. In fact, James uses this exact same word in chapter 1, verse 6. You can flip back there and look at it if you want to see it with your own eyes. So James, remember, in chapter 1 is talking about asking God for wisdom. And this is what he says about asking God for wisdom in verse 6. He says, but let that man ask in faith with no doubting. The same word that James uses here in chapter 2 when he talks about making distinctions among yourselves. Okay, so rather than making distinctions among yourselves, let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts, again, same word, doubts, distinctions. The one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. I don't think it's a coincidence that James uses the same word in both places. It's as if he's trying to tell us here, especially in verse 1, uh, or chapter 1, that the doubter is the one who keeps on making distinctions. He, he's a nitpicker. He, he picks everything apart and turns it over and, and over in his in his mind and in his hands and then rather than arriving at conclusions about how to think and how to act and how to speak that are based on faith rather than arriving at conclusions based on faith and conviction he just keeps picking things apart and going back and forth back and forth the distinguisher or the doubter 
James says, is a double-minded man. He wavers. He's tossed to and fro by the waves and winds of circumstance and fear and anxiety. And that's where his favoritism creeps in. He doubts God. He's a double-minded man who acknowledges God and acknowledges Christ with his mouth, but who doubts the faithfulness of Christ in his circumstances. And so then, without faith and without conviction, his thoughts turn to evil because he fears men more than he fears God. Why showing favoritism is so anti-Christ. And I have to believe that's why James phrases his command here the way he does in chapter 2. Look at how he points us to Christ in verse 1. Right? First of all, as we've already seen, he puts the emphasis on holding the faith. But then he's sure to remind us who our faith is in and what that person is like. He says that we should Hold the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Why say it that way, James? Why say Jesus is Lord and then go on? Oh yeah, by the way, he's the Lord of glory. Why say again that he is the Lord? Only this time say that he's the Lord of glory. Could it be that James wants us to want Christ's kind of glory rather than the glory that comes from the people? Isn't it possible that James would very intentionally call Christ the Lord of glory because Jesus actually is the only one that has the kind of glory that we should want in our lives and that we should truly desire in our lives? The kind of glory that you receive only after you've been brought low? The kind of glory you receive when you give up everything, all the treasures and peace of heaven to come down to the earth and get dirty with the rest of us? To walk off a throne and consent to have your diapers changed and your nose wiped and to be told to do your chores by the very people you came to die for. To come and to love perfectly and to tell the truth perfectly only to be mocked and spit on and arrested and crowned with thorns and nailed to a cross between two thieves while the friends who promise to die with you run and hide. And this the Lord of glory did so that he might take all God's justice against you on himself and bring you in peace to the Father so that his Father could receive the worship and glory that he deserves. And because he died, not as a sinner, but as a sinless Savior, he was raised and given a name above every name where he reigns over you right now. He said it himself. After his resurrection, all authority in heaven and on earth was given to him. And his glory and authority is his because he loved the glory of God more than the glory that comes from men. He is the Lord of glory. And James so gently but plainly calls us to hold our faith in that Lord of glory and to love and to seek that glory because everything else comes from evil. It comes from doubting Jesus and doubting the way he received his glory by loving and dying for sinners. So spiritually poor. The second reason we're told to hold the faith without favoritism is that favoritism is basically atheism. Kind of has a nice ring to it, right? Favoritism is basically atheism. Now, of course, if favoritism is the thing you struggle with, you recognize in yourself this morning that, yeah, I've got a little bit of that going on. I've let that kind of creep in to my life, I, I don't want you to misunderstand this. I'm not accusing you of being an atheist. I'm not talking about intellectual atheism where you're out in the world or trolling the internet and promoting atheist claims. Okay. So we're, so we're talking about atheism. 
just in case you lost track. And I'm talking about functional atheism. I'm talking about a kind of behavior that actually denies the God that you profess to believe. And James helps us see that our favoritism is basically atheism with three examples that are between verses 5 and 11. So in verse 5, he says, Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? In other words, James explains that when we show favoritism, we are ignoring God's grace. He says, basically, just look at the way God treats people. Does God save people because they're a certain type of people? Did he save you because you were a certain type of person? No. And that's the great thing about Christ. That's kind of the main selling point. He saves not because of how great you are, but because of how great he is. In the words of the great hymn writer John Newton, quote, Although my memory is fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner and Christ is a great Savior. So let us be sure to kill favoritism on our hearts because it just ignores God's redeeming grace. It ignores that he saves people not because of what they are like, but because of what he is like. The next example James provides of functional atheism is in verses 6 through 7, where he describes the fact that these people were favoring the very people that were oppressing them and disrespecting them and blaspheming the name of Jesus. I described this situation for you earlier. There, there must have been this temptation to try and win these oppressors over by showing them favor. But here, James reminds them, these people have made themselves your enemy. They've made themselves the enemy of Christ. They blaspheme his name, which is just, a, just another way of saying that they treat his very special name as if it's a curse as if it's not special at all. They're treating your Lord with contempt and dishonor and disrespect. Now certainly James isn't discouraging his people from loving those people. He's not even telling them to ban them from their worship services. And certainly James would call us to love people like this. But James would have us be clear about where our allegiance truly lies. He's telling them, listen, you have to be clear with these people about where your allegiance is. You can't walk over your brothers to suck up to Christ's enemies. You are showing those unbelievers when you do that that Christ is not your Lord. And you're showing them that he's not your Lord because you're not loving the brothers. Again, maybe these are extreme examples and you haven't seen anything like this happen in your own church, which is good. We would praise God for that if if this seems like an extreme situation you've never experienced before, maybe the closest you've ever gotten to a situation like this would just be somebody using the Lord's name in a disrespectful way and you feel the temptation in that moment to stay silent about that. But whatever the situation is exactly, James would have us be aware that when we favor these people rather than treat everyone the same, that's really confusing to unbelievers. It's really confusing to unbelievers when we say that we love Jesus, but we fail to show love to our fellow believers in order to flatter and honor those who hate Jesus. And the final example he gives of functional atheism in verses 8 through 11, and here he explains simply that when we show favoritism, we're ignoring God's law. We're ignoring his commands. He says, Favoritism is basically disobedience to the command to love your neighbor. It's in verse 8. And if you broke that one, you've broken it all. And not only that, and here's the really scary thing, when we ignore God's commands, we truly become like atheists because we are ignoring his character. So ignoring God's laws isn't just about breaking some rules. It's about actually disregarding, dishonoring, and not caring about God's character. Maybe you're here this morning and you're, and you're wondering, you know, why, why is it that if you break one, it's like breaking them all? You know, you've, you've wondered, if, is it fair to, for God to condemn us for breaking his whole law when we've only broken a command or two? Right, the government doesn't work like this. 
If, if I run a traffic light, I'm not charged for a traffic ticket and then scheduled for a court date to stand trial for fraud or murder or anything like that. So why is it if I break one of God's commands, I'm held accountable for breaking them all? Well, notice the way he says it in verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For, or because, he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. In other words, all the commands are important because of who gave them. All the commands come from one great law giver. And so this means that violations against these laws are not violations against a set of arbitrary rules as if God flipped a coin and said, if it's heads, murder is wrong, but if it's tails, it's open season on all the people who can't run fast enough. That's not the way it's not the way it works. That's not how God's commands came to be. God commands what he commands and calls it good because of what he is like. And so if we break even one, it's like saying that the God who gave them to us isn't good and isn't wise and isn't worthy. Breaking them means defiance, not against the rule primarily, but against the law giver ultimately. And that's, that's the heart of atheism, isn't it? C.S. Lewis, fond of quoting him on this point, Lewis said that before he became a Christian, he was a sound atheist, firmly convinced that God did not exist, did not exist, and he was very angry with God for not existing. And that's because atheism is not an intellectual problem. It's a heart problem. It's a hatred of God's commands because there is no love for the law giver. You know, so many of us worry about our evangelism. And we worry that we don't have the right answers against the most intellectual objections to our faith. We worry about how to successfully evangelize in an increasingly skeptical and hostile world. But we overlook something very simple here. We overlook this very simple reality that so many unbelievers are being taught what Christians think and what the Bible says, not by what we say, but by how we treat each other. Jesus said it himself in John 13, 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for, anyone want to know? One another. The people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. I don't know about you, but I know me. If I had to finish that verse, I would have said, people will know that you're my disciples if you love the world, right? If you love the lost, people will know that you're my disciples. And there are verses that basically say that, but that's not what Jesus said there in John 13. He said, people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another, saying that the world will know who you are based on how you love the people in this room. How you love the people in your church. The people you worship with regularly. So one of the great ways that we can evangelize the world is simply to make sure that you're loving the people you worship with each week. Not being functional atheists and forgetting God's grace to all forgetting God's law and forgetting his loving character. And the third reason why we must hold the faith without favoritism is that favoritism won't save us on the last day. Favoritism will not save us on the last day. Notice in verse 12 how James is trying to turn our thoughts to the last day, to the final judgment. He says, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So for James, holding the faith means that we believe there is a final judgment. We're Christians. And we believe that God's word is true and that there 
is a final judgment. And we believe this because Jesus was raised from the dead. See, the resurrection of Jesus is not just something that makes for a nice holiday. Jesus raised means Jesus is the judge. Paul says this in Acts 17.31. He says that God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this... He has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So God was doing a lot when he raised Jesus from the dead, but one of the things he was certainly doing was giving assurance to the world that the man who was raised from the dead would be our judge. Jesus raised means Jesus is the judge. And there is a final judgment. There is a judge appointed for that day, and he is a good judge. He is righteous. He will do no wrong. And he himself withstood the trial of death, and he took the judgment of God on himself, and he came through that vindicated. And he's the only one fit to judge because he's the only one that death could not hold and condemn. And this judge, this Jesus, is the one we will face one day, and his standard will not be Did you favor all the right people? His standard won't be, did all the right people like you? The law of liberty will be the standard. I think this term is probably used by James here, the law of liberty, to sum up all of God's standards in the person and work of Jesus. I think James probably could have just as easily have said, the standard will be the gospel. And if you think about favoritism enough, it really is just one more self-salvation plan, isn't it? Think about it. Like, what are we trying to get when we favor one person over another? What are we trying to get? Well, we're either just trying to surround ourselves with the people that are just like us so that we can feel better about ourselves, or we're trying to gain their favor and their approval so that we can feel better about ourselves. Either way, it's, it's not about them and it's not about God. It's about us doing something for us that will silence that little nagging voice in our heads that keeps trying to tell us, you know, you're going to die soon. You're going to die someday and you're going to face the judge of all the earth and he's going to have some questions for you. And all these people aren't going to be there to insulate you from that judgment. But there is someone there that can. There is someone who lives for that very reason. You know, somebody has said this, and I think it's perfect. That there is no hiding from the judgment of Christ. He sees it all rightly. And he will judge it all rightly. There is no shelter from him. There is no refuge from his wrath against sinners. There is no refuge from him but there is refuge in him. There is no refuge from him, but there is refuge in him. And so believe this law of liberty. Believe in this person, this Jesus, who has obeyed the law in your place, who has taken your punishment so that you can be free, so that you can be free to speak, so that you can be free to think, so that you can be free to act as those who will be judged not by appearances and not by performance, but by whether or not you have taken shelter in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So I would commend Him as your shelter for that last day. There is no shelter from Him, but there is shelter in Him and having Him as your Lord and Savior and friend. So, how should we respond today? What can you take home with you now? Like two ideas as we close. The first is this, and it's just to simply watch out for favoritism. Watch out for partiality in your own heart. Maybe, maybe that feels obvious to you, Maybe that you're feeling in this moment, I didn't need a preacher to tell me that was the point of the message, but surely it's not unrealistic to think that 
there couldn't be a place in our hearts where this could creep in. Maybe even this morning, you could think of types of people that could walk through those doors and get more attention from you than others. Maybe it's even easier to think of the types of people that could walk through those doors that you kind of want to avoid talking to. truth is favoritism can creep into our hearts unnoticed at first and favoritism can creep in because favoritism doesn't play favorites it can affect anyone it can creep into anyone's heart for example maybe you've heard this text applied to Christians who might be prone to judge someone based on what they wear to church and the warning in those sermons has been not to break fellowship with someone wearing informal clothing. But you know, I've known Christians who refused to worship in some churches because there were too many people wearing suits. And they've made the decision not to worship with those believers based on their first superficial impressions of those people in those suits. Some pastors might have even been tempted to preach a sermon like this in shorts and a t-shirt just to prove a point. But you know, in our context and culture, I probably could have proved the same point by wearing a tie or even clerical robes. You see, James's point isn't that we shouldn't favor the rich, but that we should favor the poor. It's that we should quit judging by appearances altogether. We should quit judging the poor man by his appearance and the rich man by his appearance because we are all needy at the foot of the cross. Now, maybe this distinction between rich and poor doesn't register at all for you on the Richter scale of temptations, and if not, praise God, it would still be important for you to consider if there's some level of favoritism that's hurting your fellowship with the believers in the church. Maybe you favor people that are closer to your education level or your education standards, or you favor them because of a shared interest or personality. Maybe you favor people your own age or in your season of life. I, I've had actual people say to me, Pastor, are there any people in your church my age? I just like to say, well, yeah, there are, probably. But you know the beautiful thing about the body of Christ isn't that we're all the same. The beautiful thing about the body of Christ is that's a lot of different people who all love the same king. That's the point. That's the point of rooting out favoritism in us. It is not a supernaturally beautiful thing when a lot of identical people get together. Because you can explain that. You can explain it when all the young moms hang out together. You can explain it when all the college kids hang out together. You can explain it when all the high schoolers hang out together. You can explain it when all the white people hang out together. You can explain it when all the introverts, well, they don't hang out together because they're introverts, but, you know, you can explain all of that stuff naturally it's not supernatural it's not hard to believe and it doesn't give god any particular kind of glory what displays the beauty of the gospel is when different people come together because they share a love and allegiance to one great god and savior who doesn't show partiality and that would be the point of rooting out our favoritism. It would let the gospel shine brighter. All right, last one. Second application, second takeaway is that we should love one another. We should love one another. James basically says in verse 8 that the opposite of favoritism is to love your neighbor. So we should love one another. We should love one another as Christ has loved us. And I love this command. It is a great example of how wonderful our God is. It's so simple. His commands are so simple. They're summed up in a word. Love. Love God. Love others. That's pretty easy to keep track of, isn't it? This should cause us to glory in our God because maybe you've noticed this. The rules that the world keeps coming up with are not simple. They keep changing. What's cool today will not be tomorrow. What people are not offended about today, they will be offended about tomorrow. The rules are always changing, always 
shifting, but God always stays the same. Love God, love one another. Love one another when your opinions and preferences are different. Love one another when people leave the church over these preferences and it leaves you hurting and pained and even angry. Love them anyway. Bless them. Be happy for them when they find other gospel preaching churches to worship with. Paul says in Romans 13, 8, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. So, brothers and sisters, I love you. And the Lord loves you better. More than words can ever say. And you and I, we, we are going to spend the rest of our lives learning how to do this better, but let us press on to learn this and to love one another. Let me pray for us as we get ready for this Lord's Supper. Father and God, we pray now for your grace to fill our hearts, for your love to fill our hearts, cause us to love one another. Uh, to put to death any favoritism or partiality in us, but to love you so much and to fill our gaze with Christ so much that there's just no room in our hearts to treat any man different than another when it comes to love and when it comes to the gospel. And bless us now as we obey your Lord Jesus, remembering him, and remembering his death, and remembering that he has made us one. We pray this in Jesus' name. And amen. All right. Okay. A couple things. Uh, we want you to join us for lunch if you're free. Um, just as a celebration of the God's blessing on our church through a couple of uh, new kiddos and, uh, that we're so thankful for. Um, so you should feel welcome to stay in fellowship with us for that. Let me pray for that meal right now. And then we will have the benediction. Father and God, we thank you for the food that we are about to receive. We acknowledge it as a gift from your hand that will delight not only our bodies, but provide us an opportunity to feed our souls in fellowship with one another. We thank you for um, baby Josie. We thank you for baby Lucy. And we pray your richest blessings on our church as we minister to them. And we thank you for your kindness and grace to us in all these things and pray this in Jesus' name and amen. All right, so I want you to respond to the benediction today. The words I want you to read are on the screen, and I'll read them too so that uh, you follow along. So first part I'm going to read, and then I'll signal you when it's your turn. So here's the word of God to send us out from Psalm 103, 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And everyone, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. God bless you. You are dismissed.